people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Blood arson and political turmoil. This was the weekly highlight of the island nation Sri Lanka. While the anti-government protests snowballed into violent clashes that culminated with several deaths and burning down of houses of members of parliament, President Gotabaya Rajapaksa appointed five-time Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe back to chair after his brother Mahinda Rajapaksa tendered resignation owing to public pressure shooting up to unprecedented levels. However, the move seems to have failed to bring tempers under control as people are still demanding the change in the government. The peaceful demonstrations in Sri Lanka nosedived into an unprecedented situation of violence and chaos as mobs set several houses of members of parliament on fire this week. The demonstrators have been demanding a change in the political leadership of the country as the island nation is going through one of its toughest economic situations in its history. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa was forced to vacate his chair after the dissent and anger didn't calm down. Five-time Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe has been reappointed to the chair. I, I have taken on a challenge of uplifting the economy and I must fulfill it. Experts say Vikramasinghe, a political veteran who has been Prime Minister of the island nation five times before, must try to address financial chaos and heal political divisions as he sets out to form a coalition government. Opposition leaders, however, have criticised the appointment of Vikramasinghe as Sri Lanka's Prime Minister. They said this was a move to pacify the protesters and not an attempt to pull the country out of massive economic crisis. Me, Ranil Vikram Singh Hamadamak, me Raja Paksha Pauli Galum Karu. Oh, Bale Labagan name Ongi Araksha Vinni. Evagi Raja Paksalat, Ranil Vikram Singh Araksha. Ekatamai Pauli or the Kahamara Katal Topi Penum Karmin Tibin. Meanwhile, President Gautabaya Rajapaksa has called nationwide curfews and given security forces sweeping powers to shoot anyone involved in looting or putting people's lives at risk. Though international bodies have urged the island leadership to withdraw such calls, the Sri Lankan's authorities say they have taken the decision in the interest of citizens' lives. Economic mismanagement, the COVID-19 pandemic and rising energy costs following Russia's invasion of Ukraine have drained state coffers, meaning Sri Lanka is running low on fuel and essential medicines and facing daily power blackouts. Vendors and people at the lower economic strata, however, have complained that they have been affected the most by the curfew. The curfew which was imposed a few weeks back but was lifted after severe domestic and international criticism was reimposed earlier in the week after the protesting mob went out of control and became involved in arson and vandalism. 
Apart from members of parliament, people also attacked Mahinda Rajapaksa's home. Their primary demand has been a change in power, as they say this government has lost its moral authority to rule the country. Talks with countries or bodies that can bail Sri Lanka out of the crisis are ongoing. But as of now, there appears no immediate solution. Some also believe that this crisis is yet to reach its peak and people will be further affected. They say it may take years and not months for Sri Lanka, a tourism-reliant country, to recover the losses they haven't cut so far. In such a scenario where there is not any light appearing at the end of the tunnel, people have nothing but to sit in optimism and expect a change in situation and their fortunes. Moving on. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi participated in the US-led second virtual COVID-19 summit this week. Modi urged the participants to build a robust global supply chain and enable equitable access to vaccines and medicines. In line with negotiations being held under TRIPS Council, Modi also underlined the Indian stance of waiving vaccine patent for the countries that have struggled to procure enough doses and have lagged behind in immunizing their people. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, on the invitation of US President Joe Biden, participated in the second global COVID-19 virtual summit. Prime Minister delivered his remarks in the opening session of the summit on the theme, Preventing Pandemic Fatigue and Prioritizing Preparedness. Prime Minister highlighted that India adopted a people-centric strategy to combat the pandemic and has made the highest ever allocation for its health budget this year. India is running the largest vaccination campaign in the world and has vaccinated close to 90% of its adult population and more than 50 million children. Modi highlighted that as a responsible member of the global community, India would continue to play an active role by sharing its low-cost indigenous COVID mitigation technologies, vaccines and therapeutics with other countries. He also asked the global community to develop a robust supply chain to meet the immediate vaccines needs of people around the world. We must build a resilient global supply chain and enable equitable access to vaccines and medicines. WTO rules, particularly the trips, need to be more flexible. WHO must be reformed and strengthened to build a more resilient global health security architecture. India also called for World Health Organization reforms and flexibility in trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights or TRIPS for equitable vaccine distribution. The TRIPS Council of the World Trade Organization has been discussing a proposal floated by India, South Africa, the US and the EU to waive patents on COVID-19 vaccines. As per the proposal, developing countries, which exported more than 10% of the world exports of COVID-19 vaccine doses in 2021, are not eligible for the waiver. The proposed solution also limits the product scope to vaccines with a commitment to decide on the extension of the solution to therapeutics and diagnostics within six months from the date of the decisions on vaccines. India also volunteered to play a key role in streamlining WHO's approval process for vaccines and therapeutics. We also call for streamlining WHO's approval process for vaccines and therapeutics to keep supply chains stable and predictable. As a responsible member of the global community, India is ready to play a key role in these efforts. 
The first global COVID-19 virtual summit was hosted by President Biden on 22nd September 2021, where the major economies had committed to extend their cooperation to prevent COVID-induced disaster. A white fact sheet revealed that the second global COVID-19 summit has gathered more than $3 billion in new funding to fight the pandemic. While there has been a slowdown in the infection rate of the pandemic, experts have warned countries to not get complacent and stay prepared for any situation. Moving on. It's not even nine months since the Taliban swept to power in Afghanistan. The women who were discriminated against during their previous regime are bearing the Sharia brunt again. After banning education for upper grade school girls, the Taliban issued a decree this week ordering all women to appear in public places only in burqa, a full body encompassing clothing. The group has received bad press and scathing condemnation from global organizations and people but they're not ready to backtrack their decision, saying 99% of women in the country are in favor of Islamic Sharia law. When the subject of women freedom was on the table during the months long peace talks with the United States, the Taliban had assured they would be reforming their approach towards girls' education, their movement, freedom of speech and profession. <laughs> Cut to nine months into power, all Taliban seem to be offering Afghan women is a repeat of its previous hardline rule when they controlled them with brute high-handedness. A series of decisions in the past couple of months have clearly reflected the group's intentions and objectives. After a ban on music, education and movement, the latest decree has asked women to not step out of their homes without burqa. And while this draconian decree has been denounced all across the globe, the ministers of the interim government have put forth the decision in a very trivial manner, as if all women across the country desperately wanted the law. Alhamdulillah, in Afghanistan, 99% of the people in Afghanistan, the women, 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 the women. Islami Marad Dagwari, which is among the people who are living in the world, is the most important او محفوظ او خوندی جوان تیر کی And while the group have referred to it as an intrinsic part of their culture, they have also announced strict punishment provisions on women failing to comply. In what seems to be a decision pushing for absolute patriarchy, men have been asked to keep an eye on them, failing in which they will be visited by Taliban officials and will lose their government jobs. <laughs> Calling it an inhumane decision, scores of women took out to streets of Kabul and asked for the rollback of the decree. <laughs> Chanting slogans in favor of a headscarf-free society, they said they were being subjected to a second-class treatment by the authorities. The decision has received widespread condemnation. From the United Nations to prominent international organizations, all have joined the chorus demanding the rollback of the law that violates fundamental freedoms of a human. UN Chief Antonio Guterres aired his concerns on Twitter and urged the Taliban to meet the promises it made regarding the rights of girls and women during the peace process. 
Nobel laureate and women rights activist Malala Yousafzai said Taliban was bent on erasing women from Afghan society. Amnesty International too joined in the Taliban criticism, saying that decision violated fundamental rights of their choice to wear and movement. The Taliban, however, have appeared unfazed by all criticism so far. It calls its decision strictly in accordance with the Sharia law, which it says is the ultimate governing principle in Islam. Observers believe that such decisions are only going to prove counterproductive as the international community, especially the West, which has already been reluctant to assist Taliban rebuild the country, will make a further distance. The Taliban have time and again called for international support, but its actions thus far haven't been in line with the intent and objectives it promised to work for during the peace process. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Thousands of eligible voters in Nepal queued outside the polling stations on Friday as the Himalayan nation held polls to elect new local representatives. Over 17 million eligible voters cast their votes to choose a total of 35,221 representatives at the local levels. The election commission set a total of 10,756 polling stations and 21,955 centers across the country to ensure voting rights of public. 65 political parties out of the total 79 political parties registered with the election commission contested the polls. The election was held for 753 seats including 6 metropolitan cities, 11 sub-metropolitan cities, 276 municipalities and 460 village municipalities. The May 13 local election is the second local election since the adoption of the new constitution and transition of the country to federalism. Scuffles erupted between Palestinian protesters and Israeli police in Jerusalem after the death of an Al Jazeera reporter who was killed during an Israeli raid in the West Bank. Palestinian protesters marched on the streets of Jerusalem carrying Palestinian flags, expressing their anger. The Israeli military said its troops came under heavy firing during the Jenin operation. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in a statement said, it appears likely that armed Palestinians who were firing indiscriminately at the time were responsible for the unfortunate death of the journalist. Israeli army said dozens of Palestinian gunmen had confronted troops who arrested a Hamas militant in Jenin. On the other side, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and Al Jazeera described Abu Akhleh's death as blatant, cold-blooded murder by Israeli military. Bennett said Abbas was making unfounded allegations before Israel conducted a thorough investigation of the events. Hystra, a consortium of several Japanese companies, is working on a pilot hydrogen supply chain demonstration project in Australia and Japan, started in 2021. Hystra was established in 2016 and focuses on lignite coal buried as unused resource in Australia and to develop technology. Several companies are responsible for their specialized field and Iwatani Corporation, which is one of them, is responsible for the basic operation and management of cargo handling operation. Lignite coal, a low-grade coal, includes high water content and impurities. Because of low calorific value for heaviness, it can spontaneously combust when it is exposed to air. So it has the defect which is unsuitable for transportation and storage. However, Hystra has succeeded in producing a large amount of hydrogen at low cost by making full use of technology. Hystra developed the liquid hydrogen carrier Swisso Frontier, equipped with the cryogenic pressure storage cargo containment system that maintains temperature of minus 253 degrees Celsius. 
so it can transport large volumes of hydrogen efficiently and safely. Hystra is aiming for hydrogen society in which hydrogen is used as commonly as oil and natural gas. It will contribute to realize green society. This is a humanoid robot that is supposed to work at a high-level space. At an exhibition of industrial robots held in Tokyo, Kawasaki Heavy Industries had attracted attention by developing it as a future robot that worked like human outside the factory, not inside. Kawasaki Heavy Industries is developing a system that remotely controls factory robot. Kawasaki's robot technology says it aims to create an environment where both robot and human beings can coexist. Moving on, Pomp and Getty mark the beginning of the Thrissur festival in India's southern state of Kerala this week. Popular for jumbos, the festival draws thousands of devotees to the Vadakkunathan temple, the temple of Lord Shiva. People come to see the elephant parading, where tuskers decorated with traditional caprisons offer them a visual treat. Temple priests in India's southern Thrissur city performed a ritual to mark the beginning of Kerala state's largest and most extravagant Thrissur Puram festival. Devotees gathered in huge numbers at Vadakkunathan temple as priests played musical instruments and performed on elephants to mark the festival in a grand manner. The grand festival was held after two years as the pandemic spread had toned down the celebrations in last two years. Coming after two years for Trishur Puram and it is really nice to watch it live that too we got a chance to watch it from close so it was really nice it's a nice vibe malayalam calendar month of maiden generally falls between april and may it is popular with locals for the elephant parade where tuskers decorated with traditional caprisons offer a visual treat to the devotees King Saktan Thamparan of the 18th century Kochi Kingdom is believed to have commenced this festival that transcends religion, caste and community linkages. Really we are exciting this year uh, because last two years there was no function like this. So we are so exciting to see all this uh, today's programs and we are happy with the we are enjoying completely, we family, we are all, every year we will enjoy this program. Devotees believe that the state drive away all kinds of negativity and make way for good fortune, peace and prosperity. They say Lord Badakkunatham is watching over his devotees. He guides them, achieve their dreams. It is an ancient Hindu shrine dedicated to Shiva in the city of Thrissur. The annual celebrations have been going on for more than 200 years in Kerala. A spectacular fireworks display which is scheduled in advance is also one of the key attractions of the event as tens of hundreds of devotees gather to watch that single event alone. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.